You can go ahead and grab a seat. And speaking of hearing with our ears, I just want to acknowledge and apologize. I think this speaker is out over here. I was sitting there thinking, am I off today, or is it just me? So if you're sensing that too, you're not crazy, just uh, maybe plug your left ear, and you can hear better. But uh, bear with me. <laughs> it's, uh, it's what we'll have to deal with today. But we can all, um, we can all hear us at least. So we're grateful for that. So um, welcome. My name is Preston. I'm one of the pastors here at St. Pete's. And it's great to see you all, to be with you all this morning. And uh, if, if you don't know, if you're just joining us um, from the last couple weeks, we have been in a series called Brick and Mortar. And we are looking at the core pieces, or the bricks, so to speak, of the Christian faith. Each one, one by one, taking them out, looking at them. We've looked at the kingdom. We've looked at grace. And this week, we are picking up the brick of justification and looking at it. Justification, woo, here we go. I hope you are as excited as I am. If you've been around church for a while, you've probably heard this word uh, in a churchy type context. Anyone heard it in the churchy type lingo? Yes, some of you, great. Um, you may associate justification as a sort of technical theological term, um, and you wouldn't be wrong about that. That's true. But you might start losing heart at this point. I hope you don't, um, but I imagine it may not be what you were dreaming of as you came to church to hear a sermon on this morning. Uh, I, I get it. The word kind of feels like it can have some mothballs attached to it uh, in some context. And no one wants to hear a mothbally sermon. Uh, at least I don't. <laughs> the two words don't go together. Um, so, you know, I, if I were you, I, I could be tempted to think that and to, to get ready for a little sermon snooze. But please don't do that. I would be wrong, and I think you would be too, because uh, what we have today before us is something that at least the Apostle Paul, in Galatians and Romans uh, especially, believed was absolutely crucial to understanding the gospel of Jesus. Absolutely crucial, a core, core piece. And guess what? It's not only Paul who thinks that who thinks justification matters. We all do. You care about it. I care about it. Our world cares a lot about justification. We hunger and thirst for justification all the time. And in this current moment of time in our world, it seems to be an even stronger undercurrent in our culture. Everyone wants justice. Everyone wants to be justified. And this is important in many ways. It's good to be part of a just world, right? And to fight for it. This is good. But let's, uh, but let's start as we get into this but by just trying to understand what is this word even mean that we're talking about? Justification. So think with me first in some different contexts. On Sunday, March 6th, C uh, there was a CTV article published called A Look at Russia's Claims to Justify War in Ukraine. Russia wants justification for their deplorable actions, but they're not going to get it, at least from most. And then on March 16th, the UN Court of Justice said they, quote, had not seen any evidence to support the Kremlin's justification for the war. They deny Russia justification. So what does it mean to seek justification? Well, it means... Is it right? Does it have solid backing? Is there good support for something to happen? And more personally, for you and for, and for me, we want to be justified. We want to be put in the right. We want to be seen as right. And I believe that's an innate human longing to desire affirmation. It's not wrong. It feels good to be seen in the right by others. It feels good to feel in the right inside your own heart. We want to be able to fall asleep at night feeling settled, feeling as if our lives, ourselves, are justified. But there's some pitfalls with this too, so I'm sure you could guess. And there's three important questions I think we need to ask about justification uh, whenever we face this question. And here's the first, who's the judge? Who gets to decide if you're justified? Second, what's the criteria? What makes you justified or not? And third, what's the verdict? Are you good or are you damned? How do these land with you? 
Well, when we talk about justification as people, it's, it's dangerous, to say this right off the bat, it's dangerous to put the power of justification into the hands of people. There are a lot of judges out there these days, and most of them are ruthless. The criteria changes. The verdicts are inconsistent. And if we leave our justification up to human authority, we're going to be in trouble. We'll have lots of sleepless nights. Because we look, when we look for justification from other people, what ends up happening is we look for it through misguided stories in our lives. Let me explain that. We all live in different stories about ourselves, about our communities, about our world, and they help us figure out who we are. A younger child story or an immigrant story, a comeback story, or a smarter than everyone else story, or an achievement story, they're endless. When I say misguided story, I mean one of those stories that you've inhabited so deeply that you now look to it for justification. A story that dominates you because you look to it to answer that question. Am I in the right? Am I okay at the end of the day? But over time, misguided stories leave you exhausted and damaged or bitter and selfish. Here's a couple examples. If you live in a story that says you're justified, if you're excelling in your career, then you'll seek justification through that, working hard and excelling. If you live in a story that says you're justified, you're good if you keep the peace at home or at work and don't say anything that will upset anyone, just don't go there, then you'll seek justification through that, not upsetting anyone, making sure everyone else is happy. This is one I've had to name in my life and overcome, certainly. And understand the difference that being a peacemaker, on the one hand, doesn't also mean ignoring hard conversations because they don't feel good for me or for other people. That's not the same thing. But that's another conversation for another day. Last, if you, uh, if you inhabit a story that says you're justified, if your posts and your tweets are all up to date and toe the line of secular values, then you'll seek justification in that, broadcasting secular values. I was in Portland, Oregon last week, and these signs are everywhere. They're everywhere in front yards. And there are others, too, like it. And my friend who I was visiting told me that it feels just as much of a message to not have a sign in your yard as it is to have a sign in your yard. A yard sign. <laughs> so that everyone who drives by knows that you're that kind of person. It felt to me like a cry for justification. Will the grand jury of the world give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down? My point is that we are tempted to seek justification from misguided stories, which are stories that flow out of a world that doesn't know God. And when we take this need for justification into our misguided stories, or in Jesus' more blatant words, the lies of the enemy, we're forced into a never-ending game. If you su succeed, you feel good. If you fail, you feel bad. If you keep succeeding, you earn the privilege to a smug elitism over others who aren't so smart or aren't so skilled or aren't so beautiful as you. And if you keep failing, you accumulate shame as you pick up the message over and over again, I'm not in the right, I'm not justified, there's something wrong with me. This game creates smug people on the one hand and insecure, frail people on the other, who both in their wounds and successes blame and throw blame and accusation all over the place. Sound like our world? All because everyone wants justification. To be in the right. To be affirmed. So we're in a little bit of a pickle, aren't we? <laughs> well, let's turn to scripture. It's about time. St. Paul wrote a letter to the church in Galatia. It was his earliest letter, and it was about this topic, amazingly. He talks a lot about it in, in Romans, too. But like I said earlier, Paul made this point. We must understand justification or we miss the gospel of Jesus. The human longing for justification is deep and goes beyond this closed loop of human earthly existence. This isn't just about feeling good. 
about ourselves or even falling asleep at night settled. This is about our value as human beings. It's about our standing before God, the God of the universe, who is a just God and who has the power to grant eternal life and eternal death. And that's why all these human efforts for justification leave us in a mess. It's a, tr it's a transcendent thirst, and it has to be connected there. So let's revisit those three questions we asked earlier and see how Paul answers them in Galatians. First, who is the judge? Who decides if we're justified? Well, the answer for Paul and for the other authors of Scripture on this one is pretty straightforward. It's God. God is the judge. God is the ultimate authority who decides the verdicts and who defines right and wrong. It may not be our first inclination to think that in a more secular world, but for these, for these folks, it was, it was God. They, they knew that was the answer. They didn't always live that way. As the example uh, right at the beginning of our scripture reading today, uh, it was uh, the, the name there is Cephas or Kephas, uh, but that's actually Peter of St. Peter's Fireside, same guy. Him and Paul were in an, a disagreement because Peter was looking for the approval of people instead of God. That was the whole issue. So they knew the answer was God, the Sunday school answer. They didn't always live like it. And now I realize, you know, when we think of God as judge, that can feel harsh, and it's not maybe the first image of God we like to hold in front of us, but it's whose God is. And I've just spent a good deal of time talking about what happens when humans are our judges, and that's not good for anyone. We need a good God to be the justifier, to be the one in charge. We need a good God for that. Well, the second and third questions uh, are a little bit more debated. I'll remind you what they are. Um, number two, what's the criteria? What makes you good or not in God's eyes? And the third is, what's the verdict? Paul answers these questions very succinctly in one verse, in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. So we'll look at that just briefly. Uh, Paul writes, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the verdict is right there. All have sinned, that we're all guilty. Every last one of us, a sinner, separate, the thumbs down. And the criteria is that, why? It's that we've fallen short of the glory of God. We're not holy and perfect like God. And that may seem a little unfair. Like, how can the bar be perfection? Be to be like God. Well, think about it this way. God is good. He's beautiful. He's true. He defines those words. And God has set that perfection as the bar. Because to be in the right with him or in good relationship, we have to be like him. Nothing short will do. And me and you, we're not in the right inherently. We're not inherently all good. God does not affirm every desire you have. And I realize that's a pretty controversial thing to say these days. But Paul says in Romans 7 that sin is at work in my body. See, Scripture has this multi-layered view of human goodness. The first thing we learn in the Bible is that we are created in the image of God. That every human bears the image of the divine. And that's amazing. We were made after this true, this beautiful, this good God, made in, made in God's likeness and made to be in relationship with him and with others and with the world around us. This is good. And every human has eternal worth because of that. And that's why human rights exist. Amazing. But the second piece is that image of God has been effaced by sin. Not erased, it's not gone, but effaced by sin. I was reading the other day about the restoration work going on at the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris after all the fires that ripped through it in April 2019. You remember that? It was pre-pandemic, so a massive event, but it's hard to remember the world before 2020. So much beauty there that was effaced, first by centuries of corrosion, but then ripped through by these fires. And I thought it's kind of like us. Created, beautiful, amazing, but corrupted and tarnished by the longings in our hearts to be like God. 
and by the evil in the world around us. You know, a slow work of restoration is going on at Notre Dame. The president, Emmanuel Macron, has vowed to restore Notre Dame to its former beauty, and even, even better than before. And God, doing this slow, steady work of restoration in us, making us even better than we were at first. That's the situation. But in all of that, we're acknowledging that on our own, we are not in the rights with God. Because to be in, to be in means to be actually in communion, an intimate communion with the perfect, holy God of the universe, the Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to be in that community, that divine community group, if you will, of Father, Son, and Spirit. And it means you've got to be perfect. So all these human efforts to justify fail miserably because our real need for justification, that thirst, is to be united with God. It's human efforts, whether it's getting a promotion or a job, whether it's curating a presence or an image, or even really good things like being convicted to tip a waiter well or to care for a friend who's struggling. If you do these things so that you are justified, so that you're falling asleep at night at peace, it's not going to be enough for you, and it's not going to be enough for God. These things, they'll satisfy for a while. They'll make us feel settled and good about ourselves for a while. But then you're Tom Brady. You run retiring for one more victory. Come on, Tom. I thought that was good. Well, the big question in Galatians uh, really is that number two. Um, how are we justified? What can make us right with God? So let's look at Galatians uh, 2, verses 15 to 16. Finally there, I know. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So the question here is, are we justified by works of the law or by faith in Christ? That's the question Paul poses. And I'll acknowledge here, understanding this question and these terms that are being used is an area of massive scholarly debate. And I don't want this sermon to get mothbally, so um, I'm just going to get straight to it and define these terms as best as I can for you. So first, what does it mean for the how to be justified by works of the law? Well, the law, called Torah, was given to Israel. It was their guide for how to live with God. Torah was the boundary marker they had to, to be marked out as Israel, to be marked out as different from the rest of the world so that they could be a witness to all the other nations about the goodness of God. Torah was the guide. It was their playbook. And they had practices like food laws and a sacrificial system and the mark of circumcision to identify the Jewish people. Also in Torah was things we're more familiar with, like the Ten Commandments, uh, ethical teaching and guidance on how to reflect God's character. And to think that you could be justified by works of the law, as Paul says, meant you had to do all of that, and you had to do it all perfectly, because God demands perfection. Now, Paul had tried this for a very long time. He talks uh, uh, other places in Galatians that he had been blameless and done all that he could to do all this uh, to the T, but he realized it was a hopeless game. Because either on the one hand, you, you failed, you couldn't do it, and so you were cursed, or you thought, like he did, that he did a pretty good job and kind of became this super holy person. But then Paul realized that that just made him arrogant and boasting. And from trying so hard, he actually missed God in it all. So either way, you're in trouble. So you're not going to be justified by works of the law. That's what Paul finally realizes. Instead, he says, it's about faith in Jesus. So let's talk about faith in Jesus. Again, uh, verses, verse 215 says, 
A person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus. So God's criteria is simple right there. It's faith. But it's not that God just started caring about faith. And this is important. When Jesus showed up, and before that, like in the Old Testament times or whatnot, that it was all about works of the law. That's not the situation. Paul says it's actually always been about faith. And he talks about Father Abraham, old Father Abe, the patriarch of the Israelites. Paul points out that Abraham, who lived, uh, who lived well before these people were given the Torah, the, the, the playbook, that he was justified by faith. It says this in Genesis. Um, Paul says in, in chapter 3, uh, verse 5 to 7, does, does he or does God who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham had believed God, believed, had faith, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. So even back to Abraham, it's actually always been about faith. But now, Jesus has come, Paul says, and we are justified through faith, but now faith in Christ, because he's the revelation of God's plan of salvation. Now, this faith in Christ, it has two parts. First, Jesus' faithfulness. Jesus is a faithful servant to the Father, a faithful son. Jesus' commitment, his agape love to us, is what justifies us. Jesus is faithful. But the other part is our trusting reliance in him, our faith in Jesus, our entering in and following Jesus, trusting him relying on him, depending on him with ourselves and our lives and our all. So it's faith and is trusting in the trustworthy one. We have faith in a faithful God who saves by his never-ending love. We're justified through faith, which means entering into this intimate friendship with God, beginning to know him, beginning to take on his life. Let's jump to verse 20. These famous words, I'm sure you've heard them before if you've uh, been a Christian a a while. Um, Galatians 3.20, they spell it out a little bit more. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So faith, again, is the connecting point. Faith unites us with Jesus first in his crucifixion, in his death, but then also in his resurrection. And when you're united with Jesus, when you die and take on his life, your whole life is then turned towards God and you're made right before God because your sinful self dies with Jesus and you are gifted resurrection life, life that never ends. And you have the life of Jesus in you. You have the Spirit in you, which is the life of Jesus, the Holy Spirit. And you're welcomed in. That's how you're welcomed in to that communion of of divine love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Paul calls all of this being in Christ. That's where all the people of God dwell, in Christ. He writes in Colossians 3.3, For you have died, you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. And that's what now marks you as a Christian. If you have repented, if you've turned yourself towards Jesus, if you've said all of me to all of you, God, then you're in Christ. You're hidden there. And your whole life is defined in the life of Jesus. That's what justifies you. That's who you are. You are in Christ now. And this is the only way to be justified. This is it. To be right before God. No human goodness will cut it. None of these other efforts will cut it. Whether it has religious looking clothes on it or not. Whether it's doing good things that that the church approves of or not. It's not going to cut it. It's through faith. It's through trusting in the trustworthy God. 
named Jesus Christ, that we're able to realize our sinfulness, even see that, turn from it to Christ and receive his love and his life and be united with him. That's justification. That's it. God is a judge. God is a judge. And when we are justified, Jesus says to God, to the Father, he says to God, look at me, this one and that one and that one over there. And each of you, they're good. They're with me. They're mine. They belong to me. They're in Christ. They're welcome. Come on in. And we have to acknowledge the converse is true too. To reject Christ is to reject his life, to reject his death over you. And this is opting for death and separation from God and his goodness. So let's bring this back around. The rat race of human justification is real. We all know it. Whatever our stories are, we all know what that feels like. And it wears us down, strips us of our dignity, our worth as humans. In Galatians, Paul shows that when we are justified by God's grace, by this free gift through faith in the faithful one, Jesus, we're opened to new life in the Spirit, to the freedom of walking with God. Some would call that, uh, that journey after justification that happens as a Christian, there's another big word that's used, sanctification, which just be- means being sanctified, being made holy, uh, because you're spending time with God, rubs off on you. His life gets more and more in you. Paul says it's this walking with the Holy Spirit, this relating to God and walking step by step with the Spirit. That's the image he uses. Through friendship, that we're nurtured and that the Spirit produces fruit in us. That comes in Galatians 5. The famous fruits of the Spirit are a result of this friendship with Jesus. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the fruit of living a justified life. These do not justify you. Only faith in Jesus does that. They are a fruit of walking with and friendship with God. It's what comes out. And the deeper we receive this news, the more we inhabit this, that we are in Christ, that we're justified by grace, our lives will be marked by these fruits. Do you remember the other pace? The thumbs up or the thumbs down from our stories, from our our misguided stories, those sucker punches of shame that come when we don't live up to them, the intoxicating superiority that sometimes comes when we do. This is a transcendent thirst. This is a big thirst that you have, that I have. And we have to decide where to take it, who we will look to and give to be the power of judge over us. We're going to put it somewhere. Jesus promises to restore you. Just like that cathedral will be restored, Jesus promises to restore you. He will walk with you continually. It's a relationship through whatever life brings. Jesus will justify you. Not based on your stories. That's the good news. It's not based on these stories you have. Not based on your success. Not based on your failure but based on Jesus' story, based on his work, based on his faithfulness, giving his perfect life, giving himself, giving his blood, giving his death to cover you and then his life. And when you turn all of you towards all of Jesus, he doesn't meet you with a thumbs up or a thumbs down. He doesn't meet you that way. He meets you with a hug, with an embrace, And a promise, I'll walk with you. I'll walk with you. You get to be my friend. God calls you friend. And we'll we'll do it together. You're not going to be alone. You're mine. You're home. Guess what? The party is planned. I'm going to throw a feast in your honor. The table is set. The wine is poured. There's bread too. Even butter. (laughs) You know, we don't have butter here, but (laughs) there will be butter and it'll be really good. Let's go have a feast. That's what Jesus says to you. You come to him to be justified and turn all of yourself to all of him.
Let's pray.